hope you're all very well and uh, welcome to tonight's I hope the the name masterclass which I absolutely hate lives up to uh, I hope the class lives up to those expectations it's half seven on Monday the 5th of February holy bananas the 5th of February I believe it begins on the 6th of June will we do that will we start off like that will we let's do the count 5th of March, 5th of April, 5th of May, 5th of June. So we're close now. We're close. And I'm sure that mock season is in full swing. And I'm sure that, you know, some of you are feeling very confident as you head into your leave insert um, English paper. And I'm sure there are others on the call who are maybe feeling a little bit less um, sure of what they should be doing in the next few months and the idea of tonight's class is to really give you an overview of um, what you need to have covered by the time you get to June. Uh, June the 6th and June the 7th. June the 6th is paper one, June the 7th is paper two of this year and really the idea is to be as clear as I can in what you need to do and then just really open to loads of questions. So I've done this Masterclass for the last few years now. Although it was a, there was a possibility I might not be doing it tonight because about forty minutes ago I was standing up at the side of the pitch, getting ready to watch an under 15s uh, uh, match, and a, a parent of one of the boys involved said to me, "Oh, hi, Paul." I said, "How's it going?" He goes, "Is that masterclass not on tonight?" <laughs> I looked at my phone and I went, "Oh yeah, I forgot." So I went back home. Anyway, that's that's uh, that's me. So look. I'm going to go through um, the paper and what to expect. I'm going to be using a number of different documents on the screen. I suppose the most important thing is it's a bank holiday Monday and you're here, which is fantastic. So ask me questions. Um, it's going to be a very relaxed class. I'm not I'm not under any pressure or stress to get particular things covered. I'm going to uh, walk through different features of paper one and paper two. And as as questions come up, if you have them, just put your hand up and you, I, I'm sure you've used Teams before. Raise your hand. I'll see your name. Say if Afric did that, her name would shoot to the top of the screen and I'd be able to say, and then Afric could unmute her mic and ask her a question. If there's a question that you have and you don't feel comfortable like unmuting your mic or whatever it is, you're on the bus or somewhere in the chopper and you can't unmute your mic, just pop your question into the chat box and also raise your hand because then I'll be able to see, as soon as I see the hand, raised, I go in and I'll have a look and see if there's anything in the chat box and I'll be able to answer any questions that come up. Usually with these classes, the questions kind of start going in the kind of the second half. The plan is that this is to run until nine o'clock. It'll probably finish a little bit earlier than that, but it will very much depend on um, you guys and what you want from me and what kind of questions you have. Just remember, I'll be running a four hour block class next um, uh, Tuesday in person. In um, in on site in Lisa Street, uh, where I go through a lot of this stuff in 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 more detail. And there's a floor, there's a four hour block class. Then I think it's on Friday of next week during the midterm, um, which is online. So if you can't attend in person, and then of course uh, we have our Easter courses really soon. I was only looking at the calendar today. Easter's not really far away at all, and I'll be teaching um, four classes, three on site, one in person in the second week, which again will be in a little bit more detail, a little bit more measured than um, what we're doing tonight. And I'll be teaching one online class in the first week. So if you find this stuff useful and you think that you might like to have a bit more, that's when you can that's when you can access me. So look, we're going to begin. And what I've done is I've drawn up this document, right? And the document is kind of like an idiot's guide to the leave insert English paper. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to just walk through the document and as I get the sections, I'm going to go to my mind maps. OK, the mind maps are kind of at the core of what I do to prepare for the leave insert. And um, I'd love you to, to, to be aware of the fact that if you can break down the different sections into kind of easily digestible um, 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 sections where you can you can study and learn, then you can make this this um, this process a little bit easier. Something I should mention before I, I continue and I, I'll come back to at the end is that there's lots and lots and lots of uh, video content available for you on this e YouTube channel. I'm sure many of you have already heard of it. Um, uh, PMC Brunner English. Um, and I just, what I do, wh whenever something comes up in my classes or I don't get something finished in my classes, I make a little video to um, 
to kind of to finish it off and I post it up on YouTube. OK, so there's many videos there. I'm not quite sure. There's loads of them anyway. And um, 96 videos, I think of the 96 videos, 90 of them are relevant to your leaving cert. Um, you know, there's a breakdown of all the key scenes in Hamlet. There are um, breakdowns of poems by the various different poets. There's, you know, the Marquis scheme, which I'm going to go through in a moment, explained and so on and so on and so on and so on. So you can have a look at that if you wish. You might find it useful. I'll come back to it at the end of this class. So look, at the top of the page here, I suppose this is core to what we have to get into our heads as English students. I've got students who are wonderfully hardworking and know everything they're supposed to know, but struggle to get above a H4. And therefore they hate English because they take the same approach with English as they take to biology or they take to history or they take to geography, and yet they don't get the same outcomes. And what you have to have in your head is, is that, you know, English is a skills exam. And if there's one thing I would suggest, all other things being equal, of course, in terms of your preparation, that you need to think about and look at over the course of the next kind of four months is the quality of your delivery, of the way you write. It's not just what you're saying. It's not just demonstrating knowledge um, in English. It's how you say what you say. It's how you articulate your points. It's how you demonstrate knowledge. It's how you organize your thoughts. It's how thoughtfully you engage with the questions under discussion. That's really what you're being judged on. The expectation is that you're gonna know your material. You know, nobody gets marks for going in and demonstrating uh, the knowledge of Seamus Heaney's poetry or the knowledge of, you know, Hamlet soliloquies. The expectation is that just like you walk into a restaurant, you expect it to have plates and, you know, forks and food. And I'll be doing the higher level English paper. We are expecting, when we open up your script to read your script, we're expecting to see that you've done the work. So that knowledge has to be there, but that knowledge is, 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 is fundamental and it's not really what you're being examined on. If you don't know your stuff, then automatically you're in trouble. But the expectation is that you know your stuff and then you've been examined on other things. So the market scheme you all know, PCLM, very, very clear. And I think it's a brilliant market scheme. They're gonna bring in changes to the Leaving Cert in the next couple of years. I hope they leave that intact because it just communicates very clearly what students need to know about um, how they're being judged. Now, I'm going to just show you this mind map uh, in which I kind of break down the market scheme. And as I said, there's a video already online on this. So I'm going to go through this really quickly. And then I'll take any questions that people have about the way their work is being marked. But again, there's already a video that explains this. Um, but the most important thing is that you get that of the, 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 the allocation of marks, 30% are available for purpose, coherence, language and mechanics, sorry, and 10% for mechanics. And the crucial thing is that the marks available for purpose, they're the marks that are going for what you say, okay? But coherence, language and mechanics, they're not for what you're saying, they're for how you're saying it. So essentially 70% of the marks available in every answer that you write are allocated for the quality of the way you write as opposed to how you write. Now, crucially, you can't access these marks, the C and the L marks, unless your P mark is healthy. And that's where the balance of the marking scheme works so well. So if a student goes in and they deliver, for example, an essay on Hamlet in response to one of these questions, I, we'll be going through some of these later on. But say, for example, you walk in and there's a question, Shakespeare's play Hamlet provides moments of riveting drama that offer thought provoking insights into the human condition. And that candidate goes in and they write an essay on Hamlet. They say the moments are riveting, but they don't demonstrate any understanding of what riveting means. And they, they're unable to explain what makes what Shakespeare does to make the drama riveting. They say that the insights into the human condition are thought provoking, but they don't demonstrate any understanding of what the human condition is, and they don't demonstrate any ability to explain what's thought provoking about it. Well, then those students are going to score a low P mark because they haven't really engaged with the question. They haven't really engaged with the question. They're simply narrating or paraphrasing the play, demonstrating knowledge without any ability to interpret the text. Now, so if they score a low P mark, 
then that low PMARC sets the bar for the C and the L. Because as you know, as you know, the C and the L cannot exceed the PMARC. Now, I know you know that already, but if you don't know that already, that's one of the fundamental things that everybody needs to know before they go in and write an answer in the Leaving Cert English paper. So I think that's really, really, really important. We know that Leaving Cert English questions are questions which reward the analytical and critical thinker. The questions require you to think for yourself. The questions will not reward you if you pay lip service to a question. They will not reward you if you merely um, uh, spew down you know, 15 quotes and lots of summary. I don't need you to tell me the story of the Harvest Bowl. I don't need you to tell me the story of Diego Maradona. I don't need you to tell me the story of Hamlet. I already know the story. That's I'm coming to you to your work with that knowledge. What I need to see is how your knowledge of those texts is used to write interesting answers in response to stimulus statements. And the extent to which you can do that successfully is the is how you're marked for P, and then the marks you get for coherence and language are dictated by that. So really, really important. What very quickly, what does coherence mean? It means planning and structure. The alarm bell that will ring for me every single time I talk to a student is if they tell me they don't have time to plan. Now I know that there are exceptions to this rule, and I know you're going to point to Billy and Jack, people who you know. Excuse me, who will tell you that they got a H1 in English. No bother, and they never planned that bloody thing in their life. Well, you know, maybe Billy and Jack are talking through their rear end, or maybe Billy and Jack plan, but don't think about it in that formal way. But the fact is that the marking scheme is built to reward work which is structured. The marking scheme is built to reward work which shows an awareness of continuity and sequencing within an essay. The marking scheme is built to reward a student who has a clear thesis in an essay and whose points are distinct but connected to the overall point that or, or thesis that's being discussed or argued. So coherence really matters. Now, just for your information, if I'm marking your leaving cert this year and I give you, for example, in a, uh, a, a Hamlet essay where the, the marking scheme is for P, there are 18 marks, C, 18, um, um, L18 and M6. If I give you 14 out of um, 18 for purpose, which is a decent mark, it's H3 standard. Even if I think that your work is a bit muddled and there's a lot of work to be doing on the planning, I'm not going to give you any more, any more, any lower score than 11 out of 14, because generally it's not wise to give a score of um, a, a deduction of more than three marks off the P mark. If the deduction for coherence is you think should be more than three, well, then your P mark is probably too high as an examiner. So that's where we see that, that kind of concertina effect that the P mark will drag uh, 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 the, the C and the L mark along. Or even if what you're saying is, is accurate, if it's just so muddled and the presentation is so confusing and, and there's no plan and you're not punctuating, I'll come to language now in a second, and, and your sentences are difficult to read, well, they're going to drag down your P mark as well, because I can't reward what you're saying if I can't really read it, if it's not presented to me in a sensible way. Now, we know that language is expression and expression is where, like there's 90 people on this call, you know, 85 of you probably struggle with expression. I've been teaching English now. I started teaching English 28 years ago, 1996, I started teaching English. And, you know, this is this is the most common issue that students have. They struggle to uh, communicate their thoughts. They struggle to articulate their thoughts with the kind of clarity that um, um, they would like. Sometimes this idea, you know, this idea, you, you know what you want to say, but you don't know how to say it. Or you have the idea in your head, but as soon as you just put the pen to the paper, it doesn't come out clearly. I get it. Believe me, I get it. And it's very, 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 very hard. It can be dispiriting when, when that happens to you. My only advice is this. Remember, the bar for language is set really high for H2 and H1s, but you can get a H3 if you're someone who struggles with expression, as long as your work is informed, as long as your work is clear, as long as your work is always relevant to the question under discussion. If you try to make sure you focus on just improving your punctuation, that is one of the 
the, the, the key things that results in very clumsy expression is, is poor punctuation. Uh, overly long, there's nothing wrong with writing the long sentence, but it has to be punctuated properly. Often, the longer the sentence, the less likely it's going to retain its meaning or its clarity. So often, students don't, um, they use commas instead of full stops. They, they, uh, they, they don't use their capitalization properly. All these things are areas which can detract from the quality of your language. And punctuation marks are marked under language, not under mechanics. Punctuation marks are uh, it's something you can really lose. You can really lose uh, in language marks if you don't punctuate properly. So these are the things we have to focus on. And one of the things that we have to be aware of is that, and this is something that every year I get asked this question about spelling. If you have a waiver, there is a metric that's applied to your paper. I'm not getting into it now. It's a, it's a, it's a, um, it's a mathematical formula that's applied to your paper, which basically means that if you have a spelling and grammar waiver, you will get all of the 10% of marks that are allocated for mechanics. That's there. If you don't have a waiver, you're not going to lose unless you're very, very, very ill-disciplined in your rereading. You're not going to lose loads of marks when it comes to um, your um, um, mechanics because you have to make it's, it's spelling. Random capitalization as well, but that's not marked as harshly, but it's spelling, mainly spelling. And if your work is, um, sorry, the, the examiner, if your teacher is, is taking marks off for you every time you make a misspelling, that won't happen in the leave insert. They have to the separate and distinct spelling mistakes. So, for example, if you misspell the word separate, which is often, uh, it's a commonly misspelled word, you can misspell that 10 times in an essay. Once it can be, you can be uh, punished for it. And that's only one quarter of one mark. So you have to make four separate and distinct spelling errors to lose one mechanic mark. And if you just do the maths on that, that means in a, in a Hamlet essay where there are six mechanics marks, you have to have made separate, sorry, 24 separate and distinct spelling errors to lose all of those mechanics marks. That would be really rare in my experience, okay? So that's the marking scheme. Purpose is key, but you're being marked. Uh, um, you, there's more marks available for how you write than for what you write. You can't unlock those marks unless you make sure you don't, or sorry, that you answer the question, you don't just summarize. And then once you unlock those marks, plan your work, organize your work into clear paragraphs and write as clearly as you can, keeping things nice and simple. Don't overcomplicate your expression. There's a myth out there that the more big words you use, the better you'll be in English. It's a whole load of nonsense, that myth. Now, so let's go back to this document. I'm just going to look and see are there any questions thrown in there. Don't forget, if you have any, put your hand up, interrupt me at any time and um, pop them into the chat box. OK, let's talk about paper one. So here's here's last year's paper one. And yours front page will be exactly the same, except for it'll say 2024 and the date will be the 6th of June. You start at half nine, you finish at 20 past uh, 12. You have three tasks to do. The three tasks are a question A, which is worth 50 marks or 12.5% of the overall. There will be three options and you've got to choose one. A question B, which will be worth 50 marks as well, 12.5%. Again, three options, you've got to choose one. And the only rule is that you're not allowed to answer the question A and the question B from the same text. And then there'll be the composition. And of course, the composition is without a shadow of a doubt, the most important part of your Leaving Cert preparation. And it blows my tiny mind how many students don't get that reality. The composition is worth 100 marks. If you want to understand how, sorry, I just want to do something here really quickly. If you want to understand how important the composition is to the people that de that design the leave insert, to the people who who are you know at, whose job it is to assess writing, in 2021, as you know, there was a reduced paper to facilitate all those missed months of um, of um, the um, due to COVID, and as you will probably know. Each paper was marked out of 140. So, for example, on paper two, you could choose to leave a whole section. So you could you could just choose to leave out poetry. Imagine that. <laughs> I'd say you'd love that somewhere, right? You could just choose to leave out poetry and then just answer on comparative and um, single text. They 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 increase 
at least a single text up to 70 marks. So that was 140 for paper two. Or you could just leave out Hamlet. Or you could just leave out comparative and answer on poetry and Hamlet or um, 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 on comparative and poetry, whatever your choice was. So they took out those whole sections of the paper, just, just took them out. And on paper two, what did they do? Well, they gave you the option of only answering on an A or a B. But the composing it was a brilliant paper. Actually, I love that paper. The composing, even in that year, stayed at 100 marks. So normally composing, sorry, my shout and I apologize. Normally, com normally. I'm conscious of this because my wife sometimes kind of knocks on the door and says, you're shouting. They don't want to hear you shouting. Thank you, Roshan. Um, normally, composings were 25%. In 2021, it was worth almost 40%. Now, come on. What does that tell you in terms of weighting? It tells you that composing is massively important. It tells you that the student who goes in with a really good sense of what they want to do in that section. And you know this bullshit, you can't study for it? Nonsense. We're going to talk about that this evening. The student who goes in with a really good sense of what they're going, what they want to do, what their options are. Plan A, plan A doesn't work out what's plan B. Plan B doesn't work out what's plan C. The student who goes into that section well prepared, the student who can hit 70 or, or above, and guys, they are rare. If your teacher is regularly giving you above 70% in your compositions, you're either very, very good or they're being very, very kind to you. In the leaving cert, it is rare to award more than 70% for a composing section. Think about it. The statistics are very, very clear, guys. About 2 to 3% of students in a normal year will get a H1. That, that, those are bald, clear statistics. That's exactly what happened last year before then they, they, they um, added on percentages for... Uh, again, based on COVID, right? But th the outcomes, when, when we were marking the papers last year, the statistics were the same. You were expecting maybe two to four across, most examiners will mark about 220 scripts. And um, when I got to number 200 last year, I had to go back and look at some of my H2s because I only had one H1 across those 200 papers. And statistically speaking, that's, you know, it's a little bit low, but it's not crazy. So you're talking about very few people getting H1s. You're talking about about 10% of candidates getting H1, H2 combined. So that's one out of every 10 students scoring 80% or higher in this section because this section lifts the whole paper. So that is a section that you can target over the coming weeks, over the coming months. And so many people, they target the poetry, which is worth 50 marks. They target their single text, which is worth 60 marks, but they neglect the composition, saying you can't prepare for it when you can. And um, consequently, they lose out on obvious and easy marks. You've got to get your timing right on paper two. Your composition, you're going to give it 70 minutes. Your, your question A, 60, and you're composing 30. With the comprehension, as I said, 50 marks, 12.5%. Three texts, you answer on one. There'll be three questions. First two will be worth 15 marks. This the last one will be worth 20 marks. Remember this, really, really, really important. Just again, I want to show you something that might might reinforce my point. Just watch this, right? So here's the 2020 um, one exam, and what they did that year to, you know, accommodate the, the changes in marking. Excuse me. Was they they reduced the part A uh, question A one and two down to 10 marks from 15, but look, they still ask for three insights. See that? They still ask for three insights for those 10 marks. Here's last year's paper one. And look what they asked for here. They asked for three insights. In the, in the third question, they asked for uh, four features of language. So just to show you one more example. Look, look, look. Three insights, four language features. I, I said one more, but we go to, to a final one. Look, three insights. Look. Uh, um, um, says it there somewhere, blah, 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 four language features. So what's the message? For every five marks available, you write a paragraph. Now, I'm telling you this, that is applied stringently by every examiner. So if you walk in and you say, well, I can only get two paragraphs out of this answer, Paul. No problem. I don't have a problem with you, but you won't be getting more than 10 out of 15. Even if your two paragraphs are whoop-de-doo fantastic, 
blew my mind. If you only make two points, you're only getting 10 marks. So that is applied really, really stringently. And again, if you attend the, 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 the course in um, next week or you attend the course at Easter, you get these mind maps. This is part of what you get. And it's, that's all broken down there. See, it says it there. Question one and question two, each marked out of 15. Question three, marked out of 20. One paragraph for every five marks available. That is absolutely crucial that you understand that you're not leaving marks behind you by not writing enough. And you're, when you're writing your paragraphs, I'll talk about the Rick rules later on. You just have to make sure that everything you say is relevant, informed by reference to the text, or in the second questions to um, by 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 um, knowledge from your own experience or a broader knowledge, and also um, that's clear and coherent. Now, sorry, somebody's ringing me here, and I have to. I'm gonna I'm gonna answer for the crack, just for the crack. Chair, just I I can't talk. I'm on a call. Uh, I'll, I'll talk to you later on. Is that okay? Okay, cheers. Bye bye. Sorry. Um, so very, very, very important. Just just I better bring me back now. What's going on? Sorry, no. How do I reject? One second, folks. Sorry. Chair. Sorry, folks, I think that might have been a, a pocket call. Now, OK, so question A is really, really, really important. And what you have to know about the question A is, guys, and I just got to, again, I'll do this really, really quickly. I'm conscious of time flying by as we go on. The first question is always easy. Whichever text you pick, don't forget there's three texts. My advice is when you're looking at the texts, read. I would always say you pick, now again, pineapples for pizzas. If you know me and you've been in my classes, you'll know. I'm always saying some people like pineapples on pizzas. I don't. It's all a matter of choice. I would always look at the three B's first and I pick the B first. We'll talk about the breakdown of the question B's in a couple of minutes. Excuse me. I would always pick my B first, right? So I go, okay. Last year, for example, the most popular question B was the, the third text because it spoke to, it was a nice broad uh, question. So I wouldn't even read. I wouldn't even look at the questions on that um, text or, and I wouldn't even read the, the passage, right? I'm not looking at that, right? Okay, so then I'm picking my my um, question A text from either text one or text two. The first thing I'm doing is I'm looking at the third question. The third question, nine times out of 10, will be on the language used in the passage. Any of you did your mocks, you will have seen that. And if you've done your work, it's easy. If you haven't done your work, it's hard. So that, that question will require you to talk about styles of writing. Usually it will name the styles here. Last year's exam, personal, informative, and narrative, descriptive. And you might go, oh, brilliant. So I'm, I'm, I'm very strong on narrative writing. I'm very strong on descriptive writing because I studied the mind map. Paul gave me these mind maps. And that's asked me about features of narrative writing. Sorry, that's up there. Thought was frozen. It's not, thank you. Uh, I studied the mind maps. So I know I can write a paragraph on characterization, including the use of dialogue. I can write a paragraph on plotting. I can write a paragraph on the themes that are universal. And it says descriptive. So I can write a paragraph on uh, the use of aesthetic language and the appealing to the different senses and or the use of simile or the use of onomatopoeia or the attention to detail. I know exactly what I'm looking for there. Now, if you haven't studied those, then you can't answer that question. So you might go to text two and text two asks about persuasive language. So, you know, you've studied your persuasive language mind map, which is here and you know what to look for in a passage that makes it persuasive. You know the, the features of a good speech because that's tied into persuasive writing. So when you're looking at your question A tasks, what you're looking to do is pick the one that appeals to you, but be aware of the fact that while the first one is always straightforward, low hanging fruit, easy marks, everybody does well on this. And the third one is the style question, which will award, reward your knowledge of those types of writing. It's the second one, part two of the A, which is often the most challenging. And that's something that, again, I would highly recommend you read those questions before you decide which question A you're going to answer, because they can be tricky. And they're tricky 
because most students feel very uncomfortable when they're required to be imaginative. Those questions, here's an example. The answer for those questions doesn't necessarily, is not necessarily, excuse me, obviously evident in the passage. So here is one from 2022 or 2021. Chadwick Boseman says, purpose is an essential element of you. Give your personal response to this observation. Now, while you can base your response in what is said in the passage, really, that's a piece of personal writing they're looking for, as opposed to an answer that's obviously in the passage. There were more obvious examples of that last year, in last year's exam, where the second question and of the first text was talking about whether you think making money is an important consideration when choosing a course to study in college. While that question was inspired by the passage, the answer to that question was not in the passage. And I corrected the leave insert last year. And the vast majority of students who answered on that passage, that was by far the most popular of the question A selections last year, did a, did a, did a I would say, a, a, a mediocre job because they they just said, well, yeah, making money is important because you, know, you make money, you have to, uh, you know, live your life and or or no, making money shouldn't be because you have to follow your dreams. And, like, <clears throat> and not only were, they, were, were their answers uninspired, you can make a predictable answer in an interesting way. That's fine. But also they struggled to get three points out of it. And so they might have gotten eight out of 15 for that question. Eight out of 15 is a H5 standard response. And straight away, you're dragging your mark down in a section where you should get easy marks. You're dragging your overall grade down unnecessarily. So be aware of those tricky second questions. The other one last year was on whether or not you think that there was a one which asked you to talk about the relationship between a photograph and a, and a title, which was, again, required you to be creative and imaginative and take care. And then the third one was, I thought, quite an interesting one. Um, whether you agreed that an ethical or moral approach to the development of AI was needed. And what was really interesting to me was that was the that was the passage that um, most people avoided. And they were right because the vast majority of even search students, and I'm not meaning to, you know, I hope you get the sense I'm not being patronizing here, haven't got a bull's notion what ethical or moral approaches are, and therefore were waffling when they were answering those questions, the few people who answered them. So this is where you can go wrong, and I don't want you to go wrong, so be aware of that with your question A's, okay? So that's the kind of the, the overview of the question A's, and we're gonna move on to the question B now really, really quickly. Now again, there are three question B tasks. It's 50 marks, it's really handy money, Usually you're, you have to pretend to be something, someone that you're not, or pretend to be doing something you're not. Always there's a framework or umbrella instruction. I'm sure if you've done your mocks, you've seen them. I'm gonna bring up the mind maps again here, just so you can see, and again, these mind maps are designed just, you know, the night before the exam, you scan over, what's the question A breakdown again? What's the question B breakdown? So here's the question B breakdown again, right? Creative writing, original and imaginative, you gotta pick, um, one task to do, not the same as your question A. You know, usually your 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 audience facing, and you have to be persuasive or argumentative. Here, the rule is about it's not as strictly applied as the question A about for every five marks available, you write a paragraph. Here, you're looking to write about five paragraphs, not so for not one mark, one paragraph for every five marks, but one paragraph for every ten marks. You're looking, if you're ambitious and you want to hit the kind of 35 and above um, category, you want an answer which has a bit of meat on the bone. So somewhere around two pages of the answer book, that's somewhere around 450 to 500 words is a, is a good question B, as long as the quality is there, of course. You can put ink on paper all you like, but it doesn't mean that the, um, the quality is there. But if the quality is there, um, an ambitious answer, a lot of people read these answers far too short. So what you've got to do is have your umbrella task and then be aware of where you're marked down here. So you're marked down if you don't fulfill the umbrella task. So if it's if you like, I, I, let me give you an example. Right. So last year, text one. The question being now very few people did this because most of them did it as a question A. But text one said, imagine you are Celine. Now, within about the first paragraph. The vast majority of students who answered that question B for either didn't notice that they were meant to be Salim 
or forgot that they were meant to be Salim and started writing as, you know, Aliyah or Africa or Ashling or Alana or Alex, start writing as themselves and immediately weren't fulfilling the task. Does that make sense? Another example would be, sorry guys, another example would be in um, this question be here, which was a personal reflection for an educational history magazine. It's a magazine article. Magazine articles get headlines. Magazine articles get a subheading. Magazine articles uh, uh, address their readership. They're, they're written in language which is um, um, accessible and easy to read. Magazine articles have, have um, feedback back opportunities you know for for the readers to, to, to give their response to what the author says the vast majority of students whose work i corrected last year in both this magazine article and in this article for the school's website didn't didn't include any of those factors and simply you know ignored the umbrella task and of course if you ignored the umbrella task well you can't score top marks so it's a like, basic, basic did it cop on you figure out what's the umbrella task Am I being asked to write an open letter, the text of a podcast, an editorial, a feature article? I, I was talking to a student last week who said that she was asked to, her mock exam, she was asked to do um, a, a verbal pitch, which is essentially a talk or a speech. I must put in speech or talk there. Where you're talking like Dragon's Den job, you're talking to a uh, you know, investors or you're talking to people who can make a big decision and you have to persuade them to do something. So it's audience aware and you're expected to demonstrate an understanding of audience. But then the most important thing, this is where students lose marks here completely unnecessarily is they write their answer and they look at the list of of um, of tasks and they ignore them. Now let, me, let me show you an example of that, right? I'll just hopefully be able to bring this up really quickly. I'm kind of improvising here. Because I was doing this work um, in my weekly grinds class last week. There's always work being done in those weekly grinds classes. I'm trying to see now if I can find it. That might be it there. These are the sample answers to last year's question. Hey, again, these are notes that um, you either get them if you attend the classes, either get them in paper form or you get them in. Um, that's the wrong one, isn't it? Yeah, you get them in paper form or you get them in um, in digital form on your Moodle 2023 QBs. There we go, that's the one. So what I would always be doing is I'd always like look at that question, the way it's formatted there, I'd right? see that there and I'd have my rough work paper and I'm breaking it down on my rough work paper, right? It's a magazine article and I have my in, my instruction verbs. Now, instruction verb number one here is, so you look for, you look for the, um, uh, the colon, describe, then it's discuss, then it's speculate. So that's my each one paragraph in each of those. So what do I have to do? Describe some of the ways technology is utilized in schools today in a positive way. That's a paragraph. Then the next one, discuss whether or not technology can be negative. That's a paragraph. And then speculate, which means that think about, look to the future and think about the role you think technology will play in the future. So you're going, OK, paragraph, paragraph, paragraph. And of course, what happened last year and what happens every year is that students often deal well, very well with the first task. They often deal very well with the second task, and then either they don't deal with the third task at all, or they just they 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 you know pass over it really quickly, which means that the answer is not going to score. Because when I'm marking that, I have, you know, this is not strictly adhered, but of the 15 purpose marks, I'll have three allocated for how well you kept the umbrella task. And then for each of the individual instructions, I'll have four marks each. And so if you don't deal with the third task and you're bringing your score straight away for purpose down to 11 out of 15, that's your top bar. And if you drop four marks, you're not dropping four marks because remember your P and your, sorry, your L and your M, sorry, your C and your L marks cannot exceed that. So every time you drop a mark, you multiply it by three. So instead of dropping four marks, you're dropping 12 marks. And instead of your maximum mark being 50 out of 50, your maximum mark is now 38, which is a H3, but more likely you're going to get a H4 when the marks are allocated overall. So these are sing simple things. If I was to say, point at two places, sorry, one place that you can really 
improve your performance, it's definitely paper one. It's definitely paper one question A's. There are areas to avoid there that you can really work on. Definitely question uh, uh, paper one question B's. They are much easier uh, uh, tasks than I think people understand. I don't think people consider them as, as uh, they don't give them the respect they deserve. Very easy place to pick up marks. And then of course, we get to composition. And composition, and I know I haven't got the paper to yet. I will get to it, sorry now. Composition is of course, as I said, so, so, so important, okay? So that's the breakdown of uh, the question B task. Yeah, composition, 100 marks, 25%. You will get seven choices. The questions are always genre specific. And in the marking scheme, it will say under purpose that the student is expected to demonstrate understanding of genre. What's that mean? If you write a speech, there should be evidence that you studied speech writing. If you write a personal essay, there should be evidence that you've studied good personal essay writing, that you've read some good, you know, um, uh, personal writing. Last week, I finished a book by Liam Brady. Have you ever heard of Liam Brady? Fantastic footballer, played for the Republic of Ireland for, oh, Jesus Christ, he must have played for the Republic of Ireland for 14, 15 years. And he brought out an autobiography. If you, if you, can, if you read autobiographies, you're, you're reading good personal writing. If you're, if you're going to study speeches, if you're going to write a speech, you should have read speeches. If you're going to write a short story, you should be reading short stories. There are books you can read in between now and 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 or or, or 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 sections from books you can read between now and the exam, which will help you. But you need to know that what kind of essays will come up. There's there's always a speech. There's always a personal essay. There's always a short story. For the last five years, there's been a discursive essay. There's often a magazine article. Although the magazine article, the task can vary. Last year's magazine article was actually. Not really a magazine article. It was essentially a, a descriptive essay in uh, in disguise. So the, write a feature article describing your hometown, um, uh, city, village, or area in which you consider some of the following. So it's looking for you to be descriptive. Whereas the previous year's uh, magazine article, was very different. It wasn't a descriptive essay at all. Obviously, you'd have your headline, your subheading. Uh, and that format for the magazine article and your and your audience awareness. But the magazine article the previous year, sorry now, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. I said I wouldn't get myself all rushing here, but here I am. Feature article for a magazine in which you reflect on the fascination with all things fashionable and explore the stories we tell ourselves through our fashion choices. That was a discursive essay. That was an essay on the, the umbrella topic of fashion and from looking at it from a number of different angles. If you don't know what discursive means, by the way, uh, there's a video explaining discursive essay writing and what that means on the YouTube channel. I won't be delving into that now. So we can see that there are um, there are there are particular types of essays that come up. And I suppose the best advice I can give you in this kind of short period of time I have before I can move on to paper two, the best piece of advice I can give you is to make sure that you understand the style of writing um, expected in each genre. So that you understand, that you've studied, once again, sorry for, for jumping from screen to screen, but that if you're going to write a short story, right? The mind maps, I break down all this on the mind map on, on the composition. But if you're going to write a short story, a discursive essay, do you know what should be the features of a discursive essay? If you're going to write a, a short story that you know what I'm expecting in a short story, if you're going to write a, a speech that you know what I'm expecting in the speech, that, that's that's a fundamental requirement. But also, guys, can I say this? And I don't want to be. I don't want to be insulting. Most people write with the brakes on. They won't. There's no imagination in the way they write. It's boring. Um, and. Uh, the whole point of the composition is that it's your, it's your chance to be creative. You're being creative when you write a speech. You're being creative when you're writing a personal essay. If you're boring in the section of the exam that's worth 25% and which is designed to reward creativity, if you're boring in that section, well, you're going to struggle. So imagination, creativity, those are crucial, crucial, crucial elements in um, your um 
paper one composition. That is absolutely, I know, I know that that's maybe difficult for you to get your head around what that actually means. But what it means is uh, uh, when we, I, I'll give you an example because I'm going to move on to paper two now because I'm, I'm halfway through the class. I'll give you an example. Last year, I have a distinct, and every year that you mark the papers, there's always one that sticks out. I have a distinct memory of a student who answered this question, the short story. There's an, there was two short stories last year. First lesson, first lesson. It was this uh, confused character in a mysterious setting. And what this student did was absolutely, it was just from the minute I started reading the first paragraph, and even though the language wasn't, you know, always controlled and there was the odd error here and there. The essay started off with a description of children playing in a playground. And I live in Lucan and across the road from where I lived is a place we were there today called St. Catherine's Park. And it was like the person was describing because you know what I mean? These playgrounds are all generic now. There's, there's a company that builds them. But it was like when he was reading it, it was immer when he was describing the playground and the kids playing in the playground, it was immersive. And I was like, OK, well, this is interesting because it's stimulating my imagination. And then there was this one kid and the kid went down a slide. But when he got to the bottom of the slide, it didn't hit. The, he didn't hit the ground, you know, the, the wood chips or whatever it is at the bottom of the slide. There was a hole in the bottom of the slide and he came out on this beach. And when he looked around on the beach, there were just loads of slides and loads of children crying. And there was no explanation of where they were. There was no explanation of, you know, um, what was happening. There was just this unbelievably vivid description of what the child felt like when they were in this place. And then there was this kind of gradual understanding that what he had to do was find the right slide to go down on the beach to bring him back to the playground where he was from. And that student wrote an essay which absolutely, it was, there was no question it was getting a H1 because it was, Character based within the within the character when he was when he was talking to other characters in the story trying to find his way home there were pieces of dialogue which included colloquial language of phonetic spelling there was a clear plot there was very 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 clear setting description there was atmosphere and tension there were themes that were easy to relate to there was a clear third person narrative voice. And I would highly recommend if you're writing a short story, you write it in the third person as opposed to the first person. You're right. You're before you put your hand up and say this. I 100 percent agree. There are great novels written in the first person, but in the leaving cert, I would highly recommend third person because what happens is when people write in the first person, they end up writing personal essays. It doesn't feel like a short story at all. There was a linear timeline, which was easy to follow. And there was loads and loads and loads and loads and loads of description. And the experience of reading the story was immersive. So that's what I mean by imagination. And even in a personal essay, you can be imaginative. In a speech, you can be imaginative. Though that's a quality that would make an essay stand out and will, as I said, compensate for some other um, issues in your paper. Now, let's get going. We are now looking at the um, paper two. OK, and this is where I know you're here because, the, because of paper two. And we're going to talk about the various different sections of paper two. Now, I will again go through this with some pace and I welcome any questions. Now, I think there's a question in the chat box now, which I'm delighted with. First one of the night. Oh, sorry, I'm flying too fast. Am I? <laughs> sorry, I'll go back. I'll go back to this. OK, so here's your here's your timing for paper two. I just want to check that question again. Uh, marks and timings. OK, so. Paper, the question A is worth 50 marks. And by the way, I don't know how, but I think that this document, you, you'll have access to this document after this class is over. I'm not sure, but I think the Institute will make it available. Maybe it'll be on the website. I'm not sure. OK, so the question A is worth 50 marks. And um, we'll talk about it. I never mentioned time management. I'll come to that now. Your question B is worth 50 marks and your composition is worth 100 marks. Now, the breakdown of the time, oh, I have it there, yeah. I have breakdown of the timing is that you're talking about 90 minutes for the timing. Now, this here, I'm going to talk about 80 minutes roughly. But really, what you've got is 170 minutes for your question A and, and your question B and your composition. And what you're looking at is to, to spend upwards. Sorry, that's, that's an error. 70 minutes. And then 90 minutes. 
I know why, because that goes back to when the, when the, uh, the exam was, was different, 100 minutes. That's it now. So you're talking about 70 minutes for your composition. I think that's loads of time. And then you have 100 minutes to do your A and B. And your A and B, let's change that there. Didn't notice that mistake before. And your A and B, usually what people will do is they'll spend about 70 minutes on their A, because there is a lot of work in the A. Like you're writing um, 10 paragraphs. You don't have to write opening paragraphs and closing paragraphs. You can if you want to, but you're writing 10 paragraphs, one paragraph every five marks available. So that takes a lot of people. You have to read the passage. You have to choose which passage you're going to do. There's all that work. So most people will take, so, you, I, I, adv I advise an hour, but up to 70 minutes for your part A. And then your part B should be about 30 minutes up to 40. Generally, I always advise people when you walk in, big deep breath. OK, so um, have a look through the paper, look at the composition titles. If you're looking at writing a personal essay, is there a nice one there? If you're looking at the short story, is there a nice one there? If the personal essay title doesn't suit you, what's the discursive? What's your plan B? Is your discursive essay title nice? Is the speech title nice? Then look at your question B's to select which one you think you fancy. Identify the umbrella task and the three, um, the three elements um, of the question. Then your A. So th there is just time there that you that you have to use at the beginning. So you're going to spend about half an hour to forty minutes on your B, sixty minutes to seventy minutes on your A, and up to seventy minutes on your composition. That's your timing for for paper one. And you know you're going to go five minutes above, five minutes below in each one of those sections. You're probably going to you won't have time. Most people don't have time management issues on paper one. So I hope that makes sense now. And uh, thank you very much for reminding me that I hadn't mentioned the time management issues on paper one. I'll actually begin to talking about paper two by just talk, by just um, dealing with that straight away. Paper two is easier. There's three sections. Sorry, there's four sections, three essays, three hours and 20 minutes. The simple instruction is well, now some teachers will say a minute, a mark. I think that overcomplicates things. I'd say for each of those big essays you're writing, you have 60 minutes and 20 minutes to write your unseen poetry. That's it. So an hour for Hamlet, if you're doing Hamlet, an hour for or, or whatever single text you're doing, an hour for comparative, which should be absolutely doable considering how well prepared you should be for your comparative answers. We'll talk about that in a second. And an hour for studied poetry. I think that's a really, really good um, time frame. There is no particular order that you should answer your paper two in and or indeed your paper one. My recommendation is that we start with your strongest and finish on unseen poetry. That's always my recommendation. Why? Well, start with your strongest builds confidence, takes away those. You're going to feel nervous. Like English paper one is your first exam. Being English paper two for many of you, unless you're doing home ec, I think home ec is isn't it? Um, on the, the afternoon of the, the Wednesday. And then is the engineering is on the uh, is on the morning of the Thursday? Can't remember. But English paper two, for the vast majority of the people, is the first kind of paper I've had to study for. So the nerves are going to be there. OK, they are going to be there. So having a very clear um, sense of process is important. And I always think start with your strongest. You won't, by the way, know what your strongest is until you look at the questions. You might think you might go in and say comparative is my strongest, but you might look at the Hamlet question and go, oh, my God, that's exactly the question that we prepared. Or, you know, I watched a video on YouTube on or I had a sample answer. I know exactly what I want to do there. You might walk in and see there's a question on Elaine de Quillen on. We talk about study poetry now in a minute, but there's a question on Elaine de Quillen on. It's just like perfect for your preparation. So you might just do that first. The one thing I would say is if you do struggle with time management, do unseen poetry last, okay? Do it last and give it 20 minutes. And remember with unseen poetry, the rules are the same as with question one, sorry, question A, task of paper one. You're expected to write a paragraph for every five marks available. I would certainly always make sure I get my unseen poetry answered. If you just get your points down, even if you don't develop them properly, you're probably going to get somewhere between 12 and 15 out of 20, which is, you know, and th those are important marks. So anyway, that's the time management for paper two, in my opinion. An error per essay, so an error for Hamlet, an error, single text, an error for comparative texts, 
an hour for studied poetry and 20 minutes for unseen poetry at the end. And there is no particular order in which you should answer those questions other than leaving unseen poetry till the end. Now, so let's get into paper two, okay? So paper two answers. Really, I suppose the most important thing I have it there, time management, 60 minutes per essay and 20 minutes for unseen poetry. That's the time management. And the most important thing is that your answers will be substantial, evidence-based, analytical, displaying critical thinking and properly structured. These are the things that you are, these are basic requirements. There is an expectation that you will write an opening and a closing paragraph in your single text and studied poetry answers. You keep your opening paragraphs really, really short. You don't need to, you know, outline your plan and to me in an opening paragraph. You just need to present your thesis to the question. You'll notice there that I said you single text and study poetry. Most people will also write an opening paragraph in a comparative answer, although that's less vital. You can in a comparative answer, you can just jump straight in often. OK, so this is really important. Keep your openings really short. I think that's really good advice. One of the places that people struggle a lot is with their um, how to open is often the hardest paragraph. So it's the hardest paragraph. Don't spend too much time on it. Keep it nice and short and don't. Um, sorry, I'll just go. Where's people? How do I go? How do I get that back the way it was? One second. There we go. Once you have your names down the side there. OK, so that's um, um, the general overview. Now I want to talk about Hamlet. All right? Now, look. If there's one section on the paper that drives me mad, it's the Shakespeare, the, the, the quality responses to the Shakespeare plays. I think people don't really know their play. If you go on to um, um, examinations, sorry, examinations, if you go on to uh, the YouTube there, that's what I was looking for. If you go on to the YouTube channel, I've broken down um, from there, every act and scene in Hamlet for you, right? Act one, scene one, act one, scene two, and all the way to most recent one, which finished the Hamlet act five. So I'd highly recommend you get yourself a decent set of summaries. If you attend next week or you attend at Easter, you get, you're going to get those summaries. And I highly recommend that you find the 20 minutes that, you know, here and there to just watch those videos back. Or if you don't like my videos, then you watch somebody else's videos. But you need to have a good, strong knowledge of the play. And then you need to get a good sense of the types of questions you're going to be asked. Now, I can see there's a hand up there and I'm going to take that question now. But it's a really important thing that you understand that the questions aren't going to be the questions are going to be, you know, write an essay on Hamlet's role in the play. The wording is the wording of the questions is what's vital, what's really, really, really important. And your ability to in to engage with the wording is what's really important. Now, Leo, go ahead. Um, I was wondering how we got the Not notes Leo. that you showed. Yeah. You're wondering how you get these the mind maps and all that. Yeah. The Is notes it? that you shared. Yeah, so that's their that's their their part of if you signed up for a class. So if you sign up, as I said, I'm doing the, the, the class next week. I'm doing Easter. I do we I do weekly classes. I had a class this evening before I come onto this call. And I don't know if you were here to start, but then went to a match and realized I had to come back. <laughs> um so there that the, the notes other than th this kind of uh, um um master class document that I've been just kind of working through. Uh, which I think they're going to display on the website. That's this document. Um, the other stuff that's that comes when you when you sign up to a class. Okay. Thank you. No problem at all. And any questions, just throw them at me now, folks, because we've only got half an hour left. So I'm going to get through as much as I can in the time we have left. But I, I'd love you just to throw any questions you have at me. I see there's a question in the chat box there. Yeah. Uh, OK, yes and no. So essentially. What I try to do, because because so guy, the, the question is this, right? What I what I what I used to do was I used to give X amount of notes in the October course, and then I give different notes in the um, Christmas course and then so on through the year. But then, you know, you get people complaining and saying, well, you didn't cover what I wanted you to cover and I want the notes and that stuff. So what I do now, guys, whenever you sign up to a course, I put everything 
all all the documents up onto in a digital form up onto Moodle. So if you sign up next week, the notes will be there. OK, that's that you'll get your notes, but then. I deal with different things in each class, so for example, I might deal with one poet at Christmas and a different poet at next week, and a different poet at Easter. The difference between next week and Easter is next week is, is kind of like this. Um, in which I'm kind of so, for example, I went through the, the approach to question A's there, but I'll actually I'll, I'll throw up a question A and you will look at one, break it down, look at some sample answers. I mentioned question B's there. We'll, go, we'll look at a sample answer. I mentioned compositions. We might look at a really good short story example or a really good personal essay example. And then at Easter, it's a little bit, um, it's not as as rushed because you have four hour and fifth, or sorry, five hour and 15 classes. So you've got six hours of tuition as opposed to four. But in terms of the notes, it's pretty much, it'll be the same documents and there's lots of them, probably too many, um, uh, lots of documents now. OK, so let's talk about the questions that I've got there. I hope that makes sense, Guy. Ella asked a question about um, women uh, on the exam this year. So Ella, here's a question that was asked in the past exam. Um, various aspects of the relationship between Hamlet and Gertrude and Shakespeare's play Hamlet are both fascinating and disturbing. So to answer your question, I don't believe there's any point whatsoever in guessing what's coming up. I do believe that there are only four key characters in the play. And those four key characters are. Sorry now, where the fuck are my mind maps? Hamlet. Claudius. Gertrude. And Ophelia. And that's why I've done a mind map on each one of those characters, which kind of walks through their role in the play with the key quotes. And I believe this, well, not believe, I know this. If you walk into the Leaving Cert with a very strong understanding of those key characters, if you go in with those characters well prepared, there's nothing they can ask you, nothing they can ask you that you won't have the information you need to answer the question. So an example of that, to, to support the point I'm making here. Sorry, no. Where am I to the past questions? Look at these questions here. Riveting drama, thought provoking insights into the human condition. Now, if you've prepared Ophelia, so she's one of the women characters in the play, you might be really lucky and get a question about her role in the play, which would be gorgeous and off you go. I would certainly recommend you prepare the two female characters and their role to, to answer your question, but not because I think they're coming up, but because I know that knowledge of their, their roles will help you answer whatever questions come up. So when Ophelia or what comes on the stage in Act 4, Scene 5, and she's mad and she's covered in flowers and she lists all the flowers that she's that she's wearing. And we understand how they're all related to Hamlet. When Ophelia um, is, 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 is confronted by Hamlet in Act 3, Scene 1, and he says, you know, I love thee once, I love you not, you know, and... and Get thee to a nunnery. Why wouldst thou be a breeder of sinners? That's a that's an amazing scene, which grabs our attention and holds our attention because we don't know whether it's going to, you know, descend into violence. And it shows how often when we are struggling and we're having a difficult time in life, we take it out not on we and, and we and we can't cope with the problems that we face. We take it out on those that we love. The same thing with Gertrude in in Act Three, Scene Four. If you look at this question here. Claudius' murder of King Hamlet has horrible consequences both for himself and for others. Gertrude ends up dead at the end of the play, tragically, because of her love for Claudius. Ophelia ends up dead because of the chain of events that were triggered by Claudius' um, selfish act to commit regicide. So knowledge of those female characters will help you. When you read a question on, um, on Gertrude, uh, or sorry, when you read a question like this, Shakespeare's use of language, including imagery, plays an important part in developing our understanding of characters. And you and you hear Hamlet saying, you know, frailty thy name is woman. Or you hear Hamlet talking about his father was Hyperion and his uncle is the satyr. And how could his mother have gone from one to the other? Well, then your knowledge of Gertrude will help you answer that question. When you see Hamlet uh, uh, grabbing hold of his mother and she thinks he's going to kill her and he talks about her, you know, um, um, in the rank sweat of an unseen bed, honeying and making love under the nasty sty. 
that's disturbing. It gives us insights into his psychology and it allows it, it's a moment of great tension in the play, which gives it the quality of a thriller of, you know, um, of um, unexpected plot twists and, uh, ten and as I said, suspense. So my, 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 my answer to your question is I don't predict topics. So if you've if you've come here for that, you've come to the wrong place because I don't believe in lying to students. I'm not a liar. What I do know is if you really spend the next four months working as hard as you can to deal with and to and to to figure out the um, the important moments or, or qualities of the characters of uh, of um, that says Macbeth. I should be Hamlet. Sorry, it's from last year. I thought I updated this document. I thought, I'm sure I did. If you do that, then you're going to score much, much, much better than if you try to nearly uh, uh, get around the hard work by preparing particular topics. Know those characters and then know the types of essays that we're expecting you to write. Question facing, you know, never summarizing, making points that are always relevant to the question under discussion. Don't tell me the story to play. I already know the story to play. I teach the play. Contextualize your points, explain them clearly in the light of the question. Make enough points. If you make four to six points in a in a Hamlet essay and you develop them properly, explaining, teasing them out, you'll have a really good length answer. That's what we're looking for in Hamlet. We're looking for it, relevant, informed, clear work, which is in which all of the evidence and all the points are contextualized in the light of the question. Let me just show you something really quickly uh, um, before um, I move on from this that I was just working on earlier on today. So one of the things I do in the grind classes is, is go through the soliloquies. There's the weekly grind classes is go through the soliloquies. And I was going through the soliloquies over the last couple of weeks. So explaining what you learn about Hamlet from that soliloquy and uh, from the second one there and so on, going through them all. OK, and then at the end of that class, we look at this task here. See this question here? The soliloquies play are an important dramatic device that add greatly to the tension and drama of Shakespeare's play Hamlet, right? So there's a there's a fantastic question, fantastic question that the vast majority of students would not be able to handle, not a snowball chance in hell. But if you can have a process for writing paragraphs in which you always begin with a relevant topic sentence, you always try to write in an informed way with putting a quote or two or three quotes in an essay, no more in a paragraph, no more than that. You write as clearly as you can and you remember to explain your points and don't just say it's relevant, but explain why. Then you can score really well. Look at this paragraph. It is 167 words long. Now imagine if you wrote five such paragraphs and then an opening and a closing. You're going to have your thousand word essay. The second soliloquy over the rogue and peasant slave am I also adds greatly to the tension of the play and proves the value of the soliloquy as a dramatic device. You've got also there because you're linking to whatever went before in the essay. You're identifying what you're talking about in this paragraph. So this paragraph is labeled and I know what you're going to be discussing. You're question facing because you're talking about the soliloquy as a dramatic device and the question asked about the soliloquies being an important dramatic device. So I love you when you write like that because you're very clear. So, OK, OK, go on. OK, you've said that now. Show me you know that second soliloquy. It is a speech which reveals the extent of Hamlet's self-loathing, perhaps most memorably with the simile when he asks why he, excuse me one second, like a whore, must unpack my heart with words. So I've shown knowledge there. Now I'm going to analyze what's, what makes that, um, what, how does that add to the tension in the drama? The power of soliloquy is evident here is the direct connection between protagonist and audience communicates the extent of Hamlet's suffering. The image of the horror of the villain of himself as pigeon livered and cowardly all combine to contribute to our understanding of this complex character and his inner struggle. We are engaged, curious and filled with questions. How will he cope? Will he overcome the crippling power of his procrastination and self-loathing? The effect of this is to engage the audience and it certainly contributes to the tension and drama. That sense is then heightened by the revelation that ends the soliloquy which you then move into for the second half of that analysis. So that'd be two paragraphs on that one soliloquy and you have a whole, a third of an essay written. So that's what, that's the kind of writing that we're looking for. And if you look at that, it has three very distinct parts. It's got the um, topic sentence, which identifies what the paragraph is about. It's got the evidence upon which the paragraph is based and it's got the analysis 
where you comment on why it's relevant to the question under discussion. And that's what you need to do. Now, I'm conscious of the fact that it's 20 to 9. I'm losing people. I've lost 10 people in the last five minutes because it's a long, long old um, evening. So I won't spend too much longer. I want to get to the poetry because I know that's why you're here. Now, remember, sorry, that's the wrong one. This is the wrong document to have open. That's why the feckin' thing is. Uh, so don't say, I, I'm looking at the wrong document there. There's another one here somewhere. That's why I was going, I've already made those changes. There's the 2024 one. Paul, you silly Billy. Does that say Hamlet? It does. I was had the wrong document open. Anyway, guys, study poetry. Just remember this year, and again, this is in the mind maps. If I can have bloody find it now, hold on. Sylvia Platt laying the quillin on. You'll see video content on these mind maps are already up and there'll be more going up. I just tried to break down the poets into simple, easy to digest sections. Paula Mean, Seamus Heaney. Yeah, and here's the, the write the poetry essay mind map. There's a there's a video that explains all this on online. But we know, we know that there will be five uh, eight poets prescribed for study and there will be five questions this year. Now, the maths are very simple, folks. That means that you need to have, have four poets ready. So if you have the four Irish poets ready, I think, and I know this, you might be thinking I'm a bit uh, controversial saying this. I think if you have the four poets ready, four Irish poets ready, you'll get two of them on your paper and you'll have a nice choice. In the same way, you can just prepare all the four women poets. And if you have those four poets ready, then I think you'll get two of them. I think of the the breakdown of the paper this year, there'll be two Irish poets, two female poets, and one of these two. My five I'm doing with my students, I'm looking at Elaine the Quillanon, Yates, Heaney, and Platt, and I'm also doing Jared Manley Hopkins. Now, by the time the year is over, I look at Paula Meehan as well, because Paula Meehan is both Irish and female, and I wouldn't be surprised to see her on the paper this year. She was on last year, she was very popular. Students not only answered on her, but wrote very, very well about, about her. So that's something that an examiner likes. But that's the reality that you have. Five poets will be examined. So you have to have four ready to be guaranteed that one of the poets that comes up is one of your poets. If the four are the four Irish or the four women, I'd be, I'd be not certain, but I'd be 99.999% recurring that you'll have at least two poets. And what you want is at least two poets because sometimes the question can be tricky. And what you want to be doing is picking the question, not the poet. So over the coming months, you're going to hear all this bullshit about, um, you know, oh, I hear Platt is coming up or, 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 or Heaney's definitely on this year. Like, so what? There's a part of me who says they should put a question, like, like to do a comparative now. They should put a question on every um, poet and just make them hard questions. The vast majority of students will answer a question and it will answer on a poet and ignore the question. So the scoring will be poor. The vast majority of students don't understand that when you're looking at a poetry essay, there will be a language element and there will also be a thematic element. And you have to be able to deal with both of those elements in your essay. You should really look to write about between, I know there are teachers out there who'll say three poems are enough. I, 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 I hate contradicting people. I really do hate contradicting people, but I don't I don't think three is enough. Four poems dealt with really, really well, you know, for me is what we're, I'm looking for. If a student writes about three, the, the, the quality of the um, of the analysis would have to be really, really, really exceptional. If there's 12 poems prescribed for study on an individual poet and you only talk about three of them and you and, and I think you're going to write a lot of summary if you write about three poems. Um, you're not demonstrating enough in-depth knowledge of the poet's work. So I think if you had three kind of core poems ready, that's a that's a good piece of advice. And then if you had, see the way here, look what I've done with Paula Mean here, right? So I've 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 said, right, I know for a fact if they ask on no matter what poet they ask on, they're gonna there's gonna be wording that will be about the way they write the style of writing. So 
say for example, well, I'll just use Palomine as an example. Or many, I don't know if many of you have studied Palomine. So there's eight poems by Palomine. So say you decide, right, I'm going to do um, heart lesson. What, what's very popular for Palomine? Uh, heart lesson, buying winkles, and the statue of the Virgin at Granite Speaks. So I'm going to, I'm going to really build my essay around those three poems. But I'm also going to be able to demonstrate knowledge of the other poems by being able to write a paragraph on the poetry use of simile or the paragraph on the poetry use of symbolism or metaphor. So for me, poem by poem is fine. You want four poems. I often like a fifth. It doesn't have to be in great detail, but just to demonstrate real in-depth knowledge. But you can have three really well prepared and then you have examples, stylistic examples from other poems which show that you're able to dip into those poems. There's no, like, remember, there's no expectation that you're, if you're, to say you're doing something like Sailing to Byzantium by Yeats or um, um, The Harvest Bow by Heaney or um, I'm trying to think of who, who, who else is here now. Let me just have a quick look. Or there's Yeats or, or um, The Sun Rising by John Donne. There's no expectation that you, 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 I don't need you to tell me the story. This happens in stanza one, this happens in stanza two, this happens in stanza three. That would be summarizing and paraphrasing and lip service, and it's not good. What I'm looking for is your ability to reach into the poem in a knowledgeable way and take out key moments that you're able to then use to illustrate a point that's relevant to the question. So just, just I know I'm going to lose, you're all going to get off the call now. We, we, we'll end the call soon. Um, but if you look here, for example, the John Donne question last year, Donne makes effective use of inventive and paradoxical language to explore the human condition in this poetry. Now, can you imagine if you had the quote from The Sun Rising, she's all states and all princes I, nothing else is. Now that's a paradox. How can a person be all states? But that's a metaphor. What he's saying is, to, to, to use a line from a 1980s song, he's, what he's saying is, you are my world. What he's saying is that, my relationship with her ennobles me, makes me feel like a prince, makes me feel, what is a prince, makes me feel privileged. That's a very inventive way of communicating something which is very human. What's very human is, you know, love and that sense of, of the overwhelming impact and power of love and, and how it, it makes, it shrinks our world where, you know, when we're, when we're in a relationship with that person, that our world, that that person becomes our world. So I can make that point about inventive language and paradoxical language on that poem and comment on the exploration of human condition while just knowing that quote and not, not referring to any other quote. Now, it would be nice if you had another, like, for example, down here, he says, shine here to us and thou art everywhere, this bed thy centre is, these walls thy sphere. There's another example of, of his inventive use of language saying that the bed is the center of the world. You know, uh, you know, how can that be true? That's a paradox. It doesn't make sense. But it, but in terms of uh, communicating his uh, obsession is the wrong word, his infatuation with this woman, it's it's a powerful and, and, and creative use of language. So then you have a really interesting essay rather than just like a summary and then saying it's relevant to the question under discussion. So with studied poetry, you need to have, for me, a really good understanding of not just what the poet says, but how the poet says it. You need to have a look at the wording of past examination questions. Sorry. You need to figure out what a poet, what a question means when they're asking about, you know, these kinds of what what uh, uh, terms. These are all from past examination questions what kind of things you would have to discuss with these kinds of language. This is the type of language that's used in past examination questions. So I would certainly not be at core to my preparation. Four poems per poet. I like a fifth, but three core and then the key images are key symbols because you know there'll be a language element to whatever question comes up. And just always, always, always trying to be engaged with the question, writing with purpose, you know, having a real structure, knowing your quotes, and again, one quote a day between now and the uh, exam, every one, one quote every three days between now and the exam, and that'll get you there. If, you, if you're doing uh, four poets and four poets, that's only 16 poems. 
So you've got plenty of time to learn your quotation, but start that process now. And of course, you never give a quote just because you know what you give a quote because it's helping you make a relevant point. So I'm, 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 I'm close to being done now. In terms of comparative, I think you know the situation with comparative this year. You know that the three modes are on. You know that you will be allowed to um, answer the standalone question with just two texts. We know that that's absolutely uh, the case. And we know that it's important that we write in the comparative spirit. And there are a lot of, um, there's a lot of video content already on YouTube about the comparative. I will be dealing with that in next week's classes and in uh, in the Easter course. If anybody wants to attend those classes, they, they'll get more detailed um, overview of the comparative. But what I want to do now is I want to just open the floor up. So there's there's a number of you still left on the call, which I'm delighted by. I know it's been a very long call. Um, I'm going to go into the chat now and see there's a question there and any questions that you have uh, before we finish up. My teacher places an overemphasis on using ChatGPT for all essays writing aspects of the English course to the point where he tells the class to use AI to write answers and learn them. What is your opinion of this? I would suggest, well, I would absolutely not recommend doing that. So I won't go any further than that. Uh, what you're doing there, uh, rote learning essays, is 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 the exact opposite of what you should be doing. Um, the questions are designed to ferret out and to punish students who are unable to um, adapt knowledge to fit with the specific wording of questions. Uh, while ChatGPT can be a very useful tool to show you uh, how to improve your expression, it's actually not giving you any skills. It's not enabling you to, to develop any um, technique as a writer, certainly not as a thinker. So um, that would I've never heard of that before. I think it's um, it's very unusual. I don't like to criticize individual teachers approach because I never think that there is um, one way of doing it, but that would certainly go against everything that, that the exam is designed to reward. So rote learning essays written by somebody else, that's not the, the approach I would take. How many soliloquies would you use in the answer? I see a question there. Um, well, it's a, it's a very, and oh, there's a good few questions there. I'll, 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 I'll come to all of these now. I'm delighted to see there are a few. How many questions would you use in your answer? Well, again, it, the, what really, you could, there, there are seven soliloquies. If you dealt with three by Hamlet and Claudius's big one, where he says, I did the murder, and you wrote a couple of hundred words on each one of them, and then you had an opening and a closing, that's going to get you to a thousand words. It be, could be really interesting and thoughtful. You could easily get to 2000 words if you went in enough detail, but you haven't got the time. So you're not talking about, you know, having to answer on every soliloquy. You're just talking about being able to demonstrate knowledge of a number of them. And, you know, you could you could use one of them as your, you know, as your um, your pillar and then branch the other ones off it. So there's loads you can say. Avoid summary and Hamlet or comparative essays. The crucial thing is ask yourself, is this relevant to the question under discussion? And for me, the most important thing, Anna, when people summarize, it's because they don't have a strategy for writing paragraphs and they're 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 they are they are they are terrified of the white page. They they just want to cover that page in ink so they feel like they've achieved something. And often they haven't achieved anything. So the question, what you should be doing before you write every paragraph is okay, what's the point I want to make here? What's the evidence I'm going to use to make that point? I know I don't have to show knowledge of every aspect. That's impossible. What the examiner is expecting of me is to demonstrate knowledge, but only to demonstrate knowledge to the extent that it's, it can help me prove a point I'm making. So in every paragraph, if, it, if, you, if you take a paragraph as being approximately 200 words, you can split it into A, B structure. In every paragraph, you're talking about at least half of it will be commentary and then half of it will be evidence. So that should give you a sense of you're only writing six or seven paragraphs of, you know, evidence from the text before you start explaining why that evidence helps you make a valid point that's relevant to the question. I hope that makes sense. Do you really do you think we only have to learn four poems or will the question limit which poems you can choose from a certain poem? That's an excellent question again, Belly or Bell. Well done. Absolutely excellent question. So if you take, for example, um, Yates, me and um, Elaine de Quillenon and um, sorry, who's the fourth Irish poet that's on this year? Uh, Shane Massini, sorry. All four of those poets do something really interesting. All four of those poets write poems that are deeply personal, but also write poems that are social or political commentary poems. So, for example, with Yet Wahini, 
I would make sure I have a couple of the deeply personal pumps. So say, for example, the underground or a call or the harvest bow or um, Moss Bond Sunlight, because they're all about his relationship with you know, people he loves and you know his his interaction with the world, right? Um, in a personal way. But then you read something like a Constable Calls or uh, the Tallinn Man, and they're not really about him, even though the, ta- the Constable Calls, his father, features. That's really about the society in which he lives. And Mian does that in, po- in poems like The Statue of the Virgin of Granard speaks, in poems like um, Prayer for the Children of Longing, Death of a Field. Yeats does that in his kind of revolutionary poems, September 1913, Easter 1916, The Stairs Nest by My Window, and The Second Coming. Um, and um, who else did I forget? Elena Quillanon. Elena Quillanon is a really important poet. You're going to see a video going up in the next week on a poem by her called Translation. Um, and I think that's a really, really important poem to prepare for her. So, yeah, I do agree with you that, yeah, for each poet, four poems, but yeah, where, where there are um, social and personal elements to their style of writing, the question might ask you to talk about both of those. So you should have at least one poem from each category per poet, if that makes any sense. Uh, bu- 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 techniques or ways to recommend to refine your writing or improve displaying your ideas clearly on the page? It's a very, very, very hard question to answer, Matthew. Again, it goes back to the fundamentals of good writing, which is paragraphing. It goes back to the fundamentals of good writing, which is planning. For me, um, if you don't have, if you set out on a journey and you don't have a destination, you're going to get lost along the way. I think a lot of students start writing without really thinking about the points that they're going to make. And I think one point flows into the next, into the next, into the next, which can mean that you can wander off the point, which be, which can mean that you, oh, you, you, you make a point twice without even realizing you've do, you're doing it and your, your work is repetitive, but not in a good way, because of course repetition can be can be a strength in, in certain types of writing. So for me, it's I have a thing called the Rick rules that I use when I'm writing analysis paragraphs. The Rick rules basically, you know, every every point or every section, because you can split a paragraph into sections, has a very clear purpose, right? It's a very, like, this is the point I'm making here. These are the quotes or these are the key moments I'm referring to. And then I know to contextualize it. And for me, rereading your work out loud can be very effective. I can see a hand up there. I'll come to it in a second, you know, in the weeks and months leading up to the exam. I think if you have a study buddy who read your work back to you, so you can hear your sentences because you can write something and think that you've made sense. But then, yeah, when you hear it back, you can see it doesn't. And again, I think going back to fundamentals of English, punctuation, sentence length, um, accuracy of grammar, these things are are vitally important. That's not an easy question to answer, but hopefully that's a decent response. Um, improve vocab for essays, especially poetry. Again, I think have a look at that mind map I showed you. Um, you need to be able to, to, to um, build a, vo- a vocabulary for for example, describing the power of an image. You need to have, I, I would certainly have synonyms ready for like, if an image is good, it's vivid, it's uh, uh, powerful, it's cinematic, it's photographic, it's effective, it's evocative, it's vivid, it's visceral. I would have that kind of vocabulary ready because I know they're going to ask me questions like that. But again, reading lots of sample answers. And again, I have loads of sample answers, just reading them um, without trying to learn them would be a very, very good um, approach. I mean, your colleague there said, their teacher said, um, get a chat GPT, do it for you. I mean, there are, there are AI tools out there that could help you uh, build a vocabulary, but that doesn't mean that, you know, if you, if you don't you know work on understanding those words and understanding what they mean and applying them, then you're not going to be able to use them in the white heat of the exam. That's extra. I've never heard anything like that before, that, that question. Never heard anything like it. I'll be talking about that for a while. If struggling with timing on paper two, should I prioritize starting each question, even if that means I leave some unfinished, or should I focus on finishing each question? I had this exact email from one of my full-time students during the week. Who is that now? I can't see. Saoirse. Hi, Saoirse. I had that exact question. And my answer was this very simply. You need to finish each essay. You've got an hour to do each one. If that means that you're writing shorter essays, so be it. But you need to answer each section. So the idea, and this is this is what my student my student said to me. They said, well, if I say if I'm trying to finish my poetry essay, um, maybe I'm better off leaving out the unseen poetry. And I said, Well, do you think that those handy 
12 to 15, even 16, 17 or 18 marks, you could pick up an unseen poetry, that you're actually going to add that much value to your studied poetry essay by by, by squeezing in another, another paragraph? You're absolutely not. So time management is an issue for a lot of people. You can practice that by, again, applying, a, having a really good strategy for writing paragraphs and writing against the clock in seven minute increments at home. That's a good way to practice uh, time management. But no, I wouldn't sacrifice answering one question um, in order to get another one finished. And I wouldn't leave an essay incomplete. I would always write a conclusion, even if you're, nobody ever feels that they've they've written the best essay they can write in the exam because it's, it's, it's time limited. But you can write the best essay that you can manage within the time. And that means having a clear structure where you introduce, develop your ideas with evidence and then conclude. I hope that makes sense. There's a hand up. We'll take the last question, it's nine o'clock. Hello, there's a hand up there, isn't there? Sorry, that's me. Hi. Um, hi, I just wanted to know, do you have any ways of improving like part two and the comprehension in part A? So those, uh, those um, improvisation questions? Yeah, them ones. Do you hate those ones? Yeah, because I usually always struggle in them ones. Because <laughs> I can't yeah. like study them type what, of ones. <laughs> well, yeah, you can't study them, but, but you can look at I think one of the, the first things you need to do is go and look at past examples. And I think one of the yeah. things you need to do is have a look at some sample answers. Now, I I I, I write sample answers to to those to those kinds of questions all the time. I, I I maybe throw a little video up on YouTube where I where I kind of show you some of them. But I think the key thing is with them that you you understand that you're not being judged for being wrong. Yeah. I think a lot of people are afraid of sounding stupid when they're writing those answers. What we're just looking for is an interesting and thoughtful response. So there's no wrong answer to those. There's just a, a kind of imaginative, uh, sorry, imaginative and original answer. But if you want, I'll, I'll, I'll put a little video up on YouTube kind of uh, showing some of those questions and so, showing some maybe sample responses to those questions that might help you. Yeah, that'd be very good because I usually watch our YouTube channel, so it does really help. Oh, good. I'm glad. I'm glad to hear that. That's, that's good to know. Thank um, you. I'm pleased. No problem at all. Now, lads, it's, we're over an hour and a half since the class I forgot I was supposed to be teaching began. So thank you very much for attending. I hope you found it in some way useful. Um, I might see some of you next week. I might see some of you at Easter. And if I don't see you ever, ever again, I want to wish you the very best of luck in your leaving, sir. I hope it all goes well for you. And again, I hope you found tonight useful. Cheers and good night, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. No problem. Okay. Bye-bye. Cheers. Thank you. 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 Thank you.